is still in the house. We were more than a week into our stay, 10 days by the calendar, and I had taught myself how to walk down the long, dark hallways without making a sound. I had familiarized myself with all the stairways that were obvious and some that were not, back stairs in front, servant stairs in front of house. I had found linen closets with hidden panels to store things. What was stored in these places over the decades, I didn't know. I understood Riddell House in a way I could only describe as fundamental. Sometimes, when I walked down the long corridor at night and ventured into the south wing, I felt as if I had become the house. The house told me when to turn, where to go next, what to discover. And when I stopped in a room during my nightly explorations, I always knew Ben was there with me because I breathed with measured breaths and I didn't move a gram of body weight. I made no sound. I waited until Ben's shallow breath fell out of sync with mine and I could hear us both breathing. I didn't want anything from Ben but the truth. He was there when my, grandfather, my grandmother died. He knew what happened between my father and his mother and father, and he seemed to be the only one who was willing to tell me anything. I stood in a room that was entirely empty except for a bare mattress on a metal frame. The moon shone across the water and tickled the ceiling and walls with flecks of light. I heard Ben's breath, independent of my own, so I knew he was with me. He placed his hand on my shoulder and leaned toward me so I could feel his phantom weight. And he whispered in my ear, tell me, he said, but I, tell me, I said, but he said nothing. That night, I had another dream. So what happens is Ben starts coming to Trevor in his dreams and starts giving Trevor dreams about the house, about the history, about what happened in the family so that Trevor starts to understand the dynamic of what's going on. Um, I just want to tell you one quick bit about the dream, where the dream thing came from. If you look at the dedication, it's de the book is dedicated to my dead father. Uh, and when I did that, my publisher immediately called me up and he said, uh, are you sure you want to do that? that it, seems, it seems a little angry. And I said, yeah, it's a little, I'll, admit, I'll go with that. It, it's a little angry, uh, but it's not, that's not why I did it. And so I had to explain to him what was going on. Um, when you're writing a book, uh, at some point, it starts with, it's like a, a, I think of it as a writer pushing a rock up a hill, a giant boulder, and pushing it, because it takes effort, and you gotta get the thing going, and get it up to the top of the hill, and then it's, um, it starts to get, picks up momentum once it starts going down the other side. So it starts out being about the writer, but at a certain point, it's not about the writer, it's about the rock, right? A book becomes, starts to tell the writer what it's gonna be about. And I was at that point when I was writing this book, and my father got very sick and uh, the long ailment that no one could explain. And they kept asking questions like, has he been to the Sahara Desert? Or has he cleaned out an attic with mouse droppings in it? Which is, uh, clearly their SARS was the only, it's the uncategorized lung ailments that are uh, an assault to the lungs. And he, he, couldn't, he couldn't recover from it. And so he was in the hospital for you know, two or three weeks with this. And when you're in the hospital that long, you start to get sick from being in the hospital. You know, you pick up secondary infections and, he got something that was quite nasty, and just the assault to the system was too much, and, and that's when the doctor came to me one morning when I went in there, and he said, I think it's time to make your father more comfortable. I was like, can we do that, please? Uh, what does that entail? And he said, ah, we turn up the morphine. Eh, and then his breathing slows, and then, oh, I was, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't get that. Sorry, I'm a little daft right now. <laughs> we were using a euphemism. Okay, let's make him more comfortable. Uh, so we made him more comfortable, and uh, and you, anybody who's had someone die in your family, you, you guys know what it's about. I mean, the business of death is something that we we have to deal with, right? My mother was distraught. Uh, my sister lives in California. She came up just at the very end, so I was like dealing with all the business of death, and I was go I'm good at that stuff. I, I'm a good producer. I, I could handle all that stuff, and I was. I took care of it, made sure everybody was happy, good party, all the whole thing. And then, but I didn't really confront the whole death of the father thing. And so it didn't surprise me that a few months later, I had a series of dreams, very vivid and clear dreams, in which my father came to me in these dreams. Four nights in a row, four dreams. He came and he sat down, we had a brief conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he'd get up and leave. And they were about nothing, about banal things. They were about significant things, they were about life, philosophy things, you know. Uh, at the end of the fourth night, he uh, got up and left, and that was it. Uh, I haven't seen him since. We like to explain our universe 
that we see and can touch and feel and smell. We love to use science to explain that, and we're good at it. And so, we, I mean, we just can explain anything away. So if you want to use our science, our kind of pop science of today to explain this, uh, we just say simply, I was traumatized by the death of my father. I hadn't processed it properly. Uh, I had had a piece of leftover sausage pizza that I hadn't reheated enough to kill the bacteria. I got had a little bit of a toxin in me. It created the, you know, random synapses to fire in my brain. Images of my father came totally coincidental, random, nothing. It means nothing. I don't go that way. That's just not the way. See, I, I've done enough reading about like the, the forward thinking scientists in this world and what they're really going on about, you know, quantum physics and particle physics and string theory and all that. We're talking about 18 dimensions or 16 dimensions or 14 dimensions, depending on who you're talking to. We're not talking about three or four dimensions. I mean, so who are we to presume we know what's going on in those other dimensions? You know, we use these words luck and coincidence and accident a lot. I'm not sure, I'm not sure those are random experiences. I think there are connections that we just can't see. We just don't understand how things are connected yet. And why, that's okay. We're learning about our world and about ourselves just like everyone, you know. We, 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 as we learn more, we'll see more of these connections. So if we look at it from that point of view, then what happened? Well, my father died prematurely. You know, he was 75 years old, walked four miles a day, did yoga twice a week. I mean, he was not the guy who was gonna die. He, he died, he felt something was unfinished with me, he wanted to come back and make a connection. <coughs> and how easy, but for, except for a spirit to come back in our, in our sleep state. Our walls are down, you know, we walk around, we walk around the streets of Atlanta, we walk down Peachtree over here with, oh, clinging to our cynicism so hard, you know, we're just so, uh, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. I, that's how we, we build up these defensive walls, but when we sleep, we don't have those walls. And so we allow things to come, we're open to getting and what, what better way for a spirit to reach out to us? They don't have to physicalize in any way. They don't have to like slam a door or like blow a cold wind through the room or, or you know, ring a bell. Or my favorite, they don't have to like write a message in a soap stick on the mirror so when you take a shower, you get out of the shower and the foggy thing. They don't have to. They can just come. And people have these experiences and yet uh, tend to, they tend to dismiss them. I mean, I, I've been doing this, as I say, I've done a lot of hotel rooms. I've been giving this talk. I talk about this, and every, every talk I give, even, even in some very, con very uh, conservative areas, someone, someone, and someone tonight is gonna come up to me and say, but it didn't feel like a dream, did it? It seemed more clear, it seemed more substantial than a dream. You remember it more clearly than that, don't you? I say, yeah. And she, someone will say, yes, I had that experience with my brother, sister, father, mother, daughter, sibling, whatever, you know. We have these experiences, and then, but we tend to just dismiss them. I wanted to write with a sudden light. That's why I dedicated it to my dead father. He, he affected me when I was alive. He influenced me when I was alive. All our fathers do, right? Either by in presence or in absence. It doesn't matter. Your father always has some influence on you in some way, uh, but when I was writing this book, he had this, this thing happened to me, and this experience happened to me, and I said, oh, that's what this book is about. It's about this connection. It's about seeing the unseen. It's about seeing these, the continuation of our journeys. And so that's why I wanted to get dedicated for my dead father. So that's a sudden light. Uh, I hope I didn't go too like dark on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it was it was uh, it was fun to write uh, in the sense of there was a lot of discovery in it um, and a lot of my, my feeling my way through it and uh, uh, I think I, I really enjoyed my narrator uh, Trevor and I'm glad that uh, I met him um, and so I hope that you guys uh, check it out and like it and sign up for doing book club stuff. Do we have time to do a couple questions, or I talk too long? No. I can do questions. Anybody have any questions? And they can be about anything. I don't care. I mean, don't worry about it. Don't try. It doesn't have to be about something like yes, sir. I would say, uh, obviously, uh, with uh, art of racing the ring, you must have done some racing yourself. Yeah. Because the uh, perspective was clearly amazing. Yeah. Do you race? Uh, I have. Yeah. I'm not racing right now. I raced uh, for a number of years. I raced Spec Miata. 
uh, with uh, Sports Car Club of America. So it's um, it's sort of an it's an, they call it, it's an introductory level because it, 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 they're not a Miata is much less expensive than a Porsche. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I, I raced spec Miata for a number of years. Um, actually, um, was the uh, Northwest Region Points Champion uh, back in I think mean, two thousand four. Uh, mostly because I showed up for all the races and no one else did. But it, you know, when the registrar gave me the trophy, she's like, hey, you showed up. They didn't, you get the trophy. Uh, I had a great time doing it. I learned a lot about, uh, I had made some really great friends. I, I couldn't continue to do it because I just had got too busy and uh, I had three kids and they weren't interested. And so I, um, if you wanna be good at racing, you have, like anything else, you have to devote yourself to it entirely with all your energy and all your time and of course all your money and. I couldn't, I couldn't do that, so I, I kind of stepped aside and, and, well, I didn't really, I mean, I wish I had, I wish I had thought about it as coherently as I'm telling you, like I did, that I just, oh, I'll, I'll come back to that another time or something. That's not what happened. I went racing uh, one summer day in Seattle, and, and it was raining, it was, we had a pretty, pretty nice rain that weekend, and uh, uh, the zebra got in the car with me, and uh, I was going down the front street, but, uh, Pacific Raceways, and I hit a patch of water, and psh, my car spun around, and going about 100 miles an hour, about 100 at that time, and, and I just, I remember thinking, you know, it's on the straight, if I'm lined up perfectly, I can make it all the way down the straight, and get to the, hit, hit the infield, and I'll be okay, and then, bam, hit the wall, and then hit the other wall, and then hit walls, and there was too many walls to hit, and then, so they came, and they, they hauled me out of the car, and I was okay, my car was completely demolished, I was fine. And I went to the infield to get checked out through medical and then I called my wife on my cell phone and I said, honey, the, the good news is I'm okay, the bad news is I've destroyed my car. And she said, and the good news is you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of news that day, but it was fun and I really enjoyed racing uh, and uh, maybe one day I'll get back to it. But you know, if you wanna be fast, you gotta really work at it. And, I don't want to be a back marker, so. I still enjoy writing these, the children's books of Enzo. And I, in fact, I just turned in a manuscript. I haven't heard back from them yet. Because I wanted to get some racing in. We did like, I, I did the generic, the opening one, and then this one, the new one coming out in, in a couple of weeks is the Christmas edition, which is really cute. And then I just turned in the Halloween uh, edition, which will be out next year. And Halloween is awesome. I mean, I said, they, I said, are you sure you want to unleash me on Halloween? Because uh, <laughs> they're already a little worried. They're already nervous about me with the Christmas one because Zoe and Enzo get lost in a Christmas tree farm. And they're like, there can't be peril at Christmas. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> there can be peril at Christmas. <laughs> and so with the Halloween, I'm like, are you sure? And they're like, no, no, go for it on Halloween. And so at some point, Enzo actually turns into a fire breathing dragon and flies through the neighborhood. And he's really worried about like incinerating children. He doesn't. He doesn't. It's not. It's in his. You, you, you'll read it. it. It's in his imagination. He's not really a fire, but he thinks he is. It's part of the whole. Uh, and, but anyway, I just turned in one of. I don't know why we're always going around holidays, but I wanted racing in it, so I do a whole racing weekend. And one of the big racing weekends, as any racing fan would know, is the Fourth of July weekend. So it's around the Fourth of July. So uh, it, it's kind of a fun one. Other questions? Did you have questions? Um, what percentage of your process is research? Because as I was reading, I said my, I mean, just meticulously researched because I'm the kind of person that reads it on my iPad and every time I'm like, is that true? Then you look it up. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, James Buchanan really was gay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's a, yeah. So, okay, so I do, I, I, I'm, I'm really bad at research. That's why I write fiction. I don't have the attention span. Uh, to write nonfiction, and it's funny because I, a buddy of mine is Eric Larson. He has, you know, you know uh, Dead Wake is his latest one. But I always say to him, man, your books just end. They don't like, you know, catch the bad guy in Devil in the White City. Why not? He's like, but it didn't really happen. I said, don't. Why are you worried about that? He said, no, he matip he researches like crazy. I make stuff up and then try and make it like research after the fact, you know. So. I did know the Buchanan thing. Um, one thing I did do, uh, I like to do field research. I love doing field research. So this new book that I'm working on right now, I'm spending a lot of time at goat farms. Just teasing you a little bit. 